kids raiding Diddy's homes. You are taking a look at it happening live as we speak. The hip hop superstar now having federal agents. This is a live look at his house in Miami. They are also live right now at his house in LA. We're going to show it to you what we're learning literally minute by minute about why this is happening, why they showed up at Diddy's house with their guns drawn. That's coming up in just a second. Plus, the legal can kicked down the road for Donald Trump with the former president getting a win for now in at least one of the cases against him. What a delay in one trial and a better payment schedule in another mean for Mr. Trump's complicated web of legal issues that whoever said spring has sprung is not looking at the weather. Our team's breaking down the snow, the rain, the overall misery of it all, affecting millions across the country right now. Plus, in baseball, less than an hour from now, we will hear from the sport's biggest star, speaking for the first time about the gambling scandal swirling around him. The big question everybody hopes he will answer. We'll see if he does later right here on this show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight we are starting with that dramatic situation happening as we speak in both L.A. and Miami Beach at the homes of Sean Diddy Combs. You know him as Diddy, formerly Puff Daddy, big time rapper, big time producer, big time superstar, and now the feds at his houses in both locations. This is a live look right now. On the left, that's West Coast, that's LA. On the right, that's Miami Beach you're looking at. I want to show you in just the last couple of minutes in L.A., agents holding what look to be guns as they walk into the home, as they enter the home, and you can see some of the apparatus there that they've brought. I want to get to Dana Griffin, who is following this for us now. Why is this happening? What do we know? Hallie, still, as you mentioned, this is a developing story, so we're learning new details minute by minute. NBC News has confirmed that this is a raid being conducted by Homeland Security and that the warrant specifically came out of the Southern District of New York. Now, we believe this is tied to sex trafficking allegations. There's an investigation into claims that he may have been, that the rapper may have been involved in this. So we believe this is connected to that. But obviously, what a split screen moment here to see investigations not only, not only in Miami, but also Los Angeles, which shows that this was very coordinated and planned. And remember, when it comes to warrants, these aren't things that are just, you know, done haphazardly. This had to be signed by a judge. So this was obviously very methodical. And this is a sprawling home here in California. This is located in the Holmby Hills area, a very wealthy area. That home that we can see from that sky cam is, is massive, sprawling. And we don't know exactly what they are looking for. It could be something as small as a USB drive, or it could be several boxes of documents that could prove or prove his guilt or prove his innocence. So... And you mentioned those guns that we saw law enforcement carrying. It sounds like that's pretty routine because they're going into a home. It's a huge home. It's not secured. But from what we have seen on the ground and from local reports that this was a very um, easy entry, there was no sort of violence or any sort of skirmish inside the home. So the weapons that you may have seen there are probably just cautionary. Um, again, this could take several hours considering that these are two separate homes in two different locations. Uh, so... We're waiting to get more details, and we're still trying to figure out where exactly P. Diddy is located. No one has been able to confirm that at this hour. Hallie. So that was going to be my other question, Dana, is where is he now? I mean, we don't know is the short answer, huh? He could be anywhere, assuming that he's not here in Los Angeles, because we saw from that chopper video several people that were taken out of the home. Some appear to be in handcuffs, and that is customary when you're doing a raid. They want to check everyone out, make sure everyone who is who they say they are. We have not seen any images of P. Diddy, which shows that he may not be in his Miami or his Los Angeles home, but I'm sure over the next several minutes and hours, we will get more details. Hallie. Dana, in just the last maybe two minutes as you were speaking, I want to say even 60 seconds. And again, this is breaking news. I'm going to give you a beat to look at your phone because we are getting in now a, a statement attributable to Homeland Security Investigations, HSI in New York. And in this statement, and I'm, I'm putting it up on screen because this is the first bit of sort of on the record information here, that HSI New York executed law enforcement actions as part of an ongoing investigation with assistance from HSI Los Angeles, HSI Miami, and our local law enforcement partners. We will provide further information as it becomes available. And that's key, Dana, as you know, because as we've been talking about, f information is not something we have a lot of at this moment. Do we know if there's any news conference set, any kind of opportunity that we might get for our teams on the ground there to question some of these investigators, or is that still TBD? Um, that's still TBD. We've got a lot okay. of our teams uh, working to try to get that information. But as you can see, they put out a statement, but there was lo not a lot of details yeah, issued right. in that statement. So that tells us a lot of information of what they are keeping kind of closed-lipped at this point. So, 
you know, again, we have no idea what they're bringing out. We may get a, a hint as we start seeing bags or boxes brought out as far as how much stuff could be you know, could, they could be looking for. But when it comes to these sort of raids, they have to look for something very specific. They don't just go into a home and just take out any and everything that looks interesting. So there's obviously something specific that they are looking for in both of these homes. And we may find out what that is or we possibly could not. So obviously we'll be following this very closely. Okay. Hallie? Dana, I'm going to let you back to the, uh, the reporting that I know you and the teams out west are doing. Thank you so much. We'll be following Thank this, you. obviously, over the course of the next couple of hours here. We are also following something else tonight. Multiple developments for former President Trump in a place he used to call home, New York. But the trial now set in at least one of the criminal cases against him before Election Day. And today you've got Mr. Trump repeating his usual claims without evidence that these cases are politically motivated. Listen. We're going through this weaponization of our government to try and knock out somebody's political opponent. And so far, based on the polls, it's not working at all. The people understand it. I don't know how you can have a trial that's going on right in the middle of an election. Not fair. Not fair. Things today playing out a little bit differently than expected because two big things were supposed to happen, right? Two big things were going to happen potentially. Today was supposed to be the first day of the former president's first criminal trial, that hush money case against him. Remember, a Manhattan DA accusing Mr. Trump of lying on business records related to about $130,000 in hush money to try to keep Stormy Daniels, former adult film star, quiet about her alleged affair with Mr. Trump during the 2016 election. That's something Mr. Trump denies. OK, that was what was supposed to happen, start of that trial. Also, today was the deadline for the former president to post nearly $500 million in bond for a civil fraud verdict. That was the expectation. Here's the reality on the hush money stuff. It was just a hearing for a future date for that trial to start. We now know that's going to be April 15th. That's now the new date to circle on your calendar. On the civil fraud side of things, the former president is getting more time to pay less money. Ten more days to post $175 million. That is a win for him. I want to bring in Dasha Burns live for us uh, in New York. Laura Jarrett, our NBC News legal correspondent, is joining us well. Dasha, let me start with you here on the political front. Talk us through what you're hearing from your sources in and around Trump world and what we've heard from the former president today. Well, he's already fundraising off of what he calls a victory, the fact that uh, Trump Tower is not getting seized today, but telling voters that uh, the victory is not over, that more is to be done, and asking them to donate. We've seen this time and again, anytime uh, he, there's a ruling in one of these cases, usually it comes along with a fundraising request. But here's what he had to say about all of this outside of the court today. Listen. I have a lot of cash. You know I do because you looked at my statements. But I would also like to be able to use some of my cash to get elected. They don't want me to use my cash to get elected. They don't want that. They don't want me taking cash out to use it for the campaign. And this is exactly the kind of statement that is problematic for his lawyers who have been saying that the former president cannot get enough money to pay uh, that bond, to, to, to put up that bond. So uh, not so great for the lawyers, but politically, the former president trying to use this uh, to, to shout victory and to, again, claim that this is an unfair persecution, Hallie. We've also got, with jury selection starting mid-April now, the potential to see much more of Mr. Trump in New York for that first criminal trial. Fair to say that New York is not known for being a big swing state, Dasha, but there he will be no. even overlaid on top of his campaign schedule. How much does that uh, play a factor into former President Trump getting on the road, doing these rallies? He likes to do them on Saturdays, right? Right. I think we're going to be working on a lot of weekends, Hallie. And by the way, <laughs> congratulations on the on the new weekend gig. Thank uh, you, but look, it, it, this is a, certainly a, a blue state, not going to win over a lot of new voters here. But what's going to be here? Us. The cameras are going to be here, right? So mm. he is going to be looking to use this as a campaign stop of sorts. Again, it was very successful for him in the primary, but a very different voter base then than a general electorate. However, he has been known to, to, to use this to his advantage and to use it to take that time, to take that airspace, to suck up the oxygen from the room and uh, hoping that that is going to be uh, an advantage even if he can't be out on the trail. The other thing, Hallie, is he will be leaning on his surrogates, uh, Donald Trump Jr., Eric, Lara, Kimberly Guilfoyle, uh, the family that sort of really represents him and can rally the base in his stead, Hallie. 
Dasha Burns live for us there in New York. Thank you. Laura Jarrett, let me bring you in now, because if there is an umbrella theme, I think, to today as it relates to former President Trump, it is he bought himself a little bit more time on both these fronts. He did, though, Hallie, although I have to say the April 15th date, this judge really does seem to want it to be set in stone. The only reason okay. this case is not starting today, Hallie, is because the defense team had accused the prosecutors of something really serious that the judge said he essentially felt like had been wasted for his time. He, they had been accused of prosecutorial misconduct for withholding documents related to a key witness, Michael Cohen, who we're all familiar with. The judge heard a lot of argument, a lot of finger-pointing about that today, and basically found it all unfounded. And at the end of it, essentially said, I don't even know why we're here. He's finding this odd. So he said, I'm going to see you on April 15th. And I did not get any indication that the judge appears to be at all interested in moving that trial date. Of course, the former president is very, very focused on this civil fraud trial. It's not a criminal mm. case, but it is his namesake company. It is his control. He called it his babies today in a true social post. And now he got essentially the relief of a lifetime by not having to offer up that more than $500, $450 million nut that he was going to have to front yeah. himself, Hallie. He could find no lender who was willing to give him that serious amount of cash. It's not like $175 million is pennies on the dollar right. for like most normal human beings, but it's certainly not half a billion, Laura, to your point here. You know, the other thing is just to talk about this idea of the April 15th trial date or jury selection to begin in this hush money trial. That is the one, and you and I have talked about this over the course of many months here, that it seems legal experts think, and frankly, some political observers, could be the least impactful for former President Trump. And yet, that is the one, as you look at the, the array of criminal cases against him, that seems, of course, most likely to wrap up before Election Day, maybe even before the Republican convention. In some ways, it's, you know, it was the first filed, and it appears to be the first to go. Even if the facts are all well known, even if legally it's not perhaps the most sophisticated, even if it's state versus federal, at the end of the day, it's realistically the one that's going. All the other ones are bogged down in delays. Some of them don't even have real trial dates right now. Mm. Um, and so I think everybody should kind of get their heads around the fact that this is the one that's going to trial. And it's still historic. We have never seen a former president have to sit in a courtroom for the better part of six weeks in the middle of an election year where he is facing a potential felony here in New York, Hallie. Laura Jarrett, live for us with a lot, a lot to juggle today. We'll look for more of your reporting on Nightly Tonight. Laura, thanks. Thanks. Listen, let's talk about the bad weather tonight that is happening really all over the map. Look at this. Snow, wind, storms, maybe tornadoes with a massive spring system moving through the Midwest. Spots that got snow, look at this, more than a foot in some places. Now, getting soaked with a ton of rain. And out west, a dramatic rescue. Look at this, first responders pulling a woman out of the LA River after she fell into the water during a storm there. Down south, you've got millions bracing for the weather alerts that are stretching into the night. Our team, all over this for you. Meteorologist Bill Karens standing by with the places that could see tornadoes later on. But I wanna bring in first Jesse Kirsch from Minneapolis. And Jesse, it was snow, now it's rain, kind of slush, might be snow again. Bottom line, it is Miz for the folks where you are. Yeah, we need some fruit color and make some snow cones out here, Hallie. We, we woke up this morning, it was rain. Then it was wet snow. Then it went back to rain. And it tells it's just this gross drizzle out here right now. Uh, but make no mistake, there's still a good amount of snow out here in the plains. We're talking about more than a foot of snow across stretches of Colorado, Wisconsin, and here in Minnesota. The Twin Cities, as you mentioned, Hallie, are potentially going to be getting more snow tomorrow. Uh, and as this heavy wet stuff was falling this morning to start the work week, we caught up with some people. And bottom line, if you're from the Midwest, if you're from here in the Twin Cities, this doesn't really surprise people this time of year. I lived in Chicago for years. I can tell you, you know, this isn't something people look twice at. Uh, but we asked people about it and we spoke with someone who was doing what you're seeing right there on screen, digging up this wet slushy, slushy mess. And here's what he shared with us about what he sees when the snow's falling from the sky. Well, it's normal Minnesota, yeah. Uh, all I see is money falling from the, the sky. That's all I see. This is just what we know, and it's beautiful. So, you know, you can either sit inside and be miserable or out, get out and enjoy it. In the interest of disclosure, she did tell me she's working from home today, unlike some of us. Uh, so she is, is not, you know, having to trek out there too much. She went to get the morning coffee and back to work at home. But uh, again, we're not through this yet up here in the Twin Cities, Hallie.
Jesse Kirsch, uh, live for us there. Uh, we look forward to more of your reporting, I know, throughout the night. We'll see what happens next hour. Thanks. Let me bring in Bill Karens now. And as we talk about what could happen next hour, next couple hours, where you're looking at down south, it's the tornado threat, right? Yeah, same storm, just the warm side of it. And we've yeah. had a tornado watch that's been up for like the last two hours. We haven't had any severe thunderstorms, haven't had any tornado warnings. And from what I'm seeing on the radar, conditions aren't exactly ripe for you know, a bunch of tornadoes. Still maybe one or two isolated, which can do a lot of damage. But nothing that looks, you know, nothing's speaking and screaming, saying this looks like a huge issue this evening. So this area of orange is what we call the enhanced risk. This is the favorite area for storms. Right now, the storms are where my hand is here. Alexandria to Monroe, all the way down to Lake Charles. So they're going to start heading into this more favorable environment this evening. So that's why we still think there's a chance of getting a strong tornado, even as the sun is setting into the evening from Jackson, the Meridian, and the Hattiesburg. So central Mississippi, by the time these storms get to Alabama late tonight, they should be weakening. So here's the tornado watch, and a, a little bit of it, actually the Shreveport area, has been trimmed off. So this is the main line of storms. You can see it from Monroe to Alexandria. This tornado watch goes until about 8 o'clock. There may be one that extends after it. A closer view shows you when you get a line like this, we're not as concerned with tornadoes with this. If we get thunderstorms we call supercells that are out by themselves, those are the ones that usually typically produce the most damaging tornadoes. Doesn't mean we can't get a small spin up, but not like anything that's going to be big and devastating to take out of town. And here's Monroe, Louisiana. Thunderstorms over the top of you, but not severe. Just, you know, a lot of lightning and just your typical downpours. So the storm is over Kansas City. This is the area of severe potential tonight. And then we still have the backside of the snow. And in Minneapolis, yes, now it was raining. They are expected to get some more snow. So winter weather advisory has been reposted for the Minneapolis areas. We still have blizzard warnings in Nebraska. And where Jesse was located there, we're now thinking it could be another six inches of snow. So Minneapolis, by the way, had about eight to nine inches, a rainy day today, and now another six inches on top of it. So, yeah, sloppy, messy is uh, the word for uh, the Twin Cities. Bill Karens, we're going to see how the rest of it goes uh, throughout yes. the course of the night. Thank you very much. We are also standing by because in just about a half an hour, it is a busy Monday, gang. In just about a half an hour, we expect to hear from Shohei Otani, the Dodgers superstar, for the very first time since his interpreter was fired last week with these allegations of illegal gambling, with these allegations he stole from Otani. Now, listen, what do we expect? Let me just manage some of those expectations. It doesn't sound like it's going to be some big, spicy, fireworksy press conference, right? It sounds like Otani will be reading a statement, no questions. But we will see if he answers the big question surrounding this scandal. Did he lend millions of dollars to his interpreter, like the interpreter told ESPN? Or will he repeat his lawyer's claims that the money was stolen? It is a big deal, this whole thing, casting a shadow over the MLB and over opening day in Los Angeles for the Dodgers coming up on Thursday. David Noriega is joining us now. Talk about what Otani needs to say and what can he say, given some of these investigations that have now been opened into this whole situation. Yeah, Holly, you know, I think one of the reasons that this story has exploded so much and that there's been so much speculation around it is specifically yeah. because we have not heard from Otani and there's been a void of information, not to mention sort of changing stories, lots of ambiguity. It's been super murky. You're right to point out that there isn't much he can say because there are criminal IRS investigations into this illegal gambling ring in Orange County. Uh, we've been told, you know, the AP reported, we are still working to confirm that his interpreter is directly being investigated by the IRS. MLB now is also investigating the entire affair. So there isn't very much that he can say. Remember also that Otani is a pretty famously sort of private, quiet, not even yeah. reclusive character. So I don't think we can really expect much from him to begin with. And to be honest, the way I feel about this is if he comes out and gives a statement that's pretty scant on details or substance, it's probably not going to do much to tamp down the speculation. Howie? This has also put a lot of attention, but a huge spotlight, tons of scrutiny on this interpreter. NBC News in L.A., our station out there, was the first to report about possible inaccuracies in his bio. Yeah, so Ipe Mizuhara... Who, you know, people who report on sports and uh, people who pay attention to this world actually just know him by on a, like a first name basis. He's just yeah. pay in this world. Ipe. He's sort of a micro celebrity in his own right, specifically because he has been sort of glued to Otani for 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 so long. Right. It's like he wasn't just his interpreter. He was his right hand man, his confidant, his best friend. 
Um, so the fact that there's been this rift between them, this supposed betrayal, at least that's how Otani's lawyers are presenting it now, is really huge. This press conference today is going to be the first time really that we've seen him come out and give a statement without him acting, without Mizuhara acting as the interpreter. You're right, too. There are questions emerging now, some inconsistencies in what he said is his background, which universities he went to, which jobs he had prior to this one. Um, there, there's a lot of sort of shadiness around him as a person, which I think is probably only likely to grow. Also, consider that his story changed when it comes to this, too, right? That's like, right. he said that he, that, 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 um, that Otani had basically bailed him out to the tune of $4.5 million of gambling debts, and then he subsequently acknowledged that actually Otani didn't know anything about this, and, and then kind of quieted down and sort of disappeared from the spotlight. So just tons of inconsistencies, tons of murkiness, and as you pointed out, it has the potential to really besmirch the reputation of not just the best baseball player in the league, but one of the baseball players in the league with kind of the, the purest, most scandal-free reputations out there. Allie? David Noriega, um, listen, I'm looking at my clock here. It's about 25 minutes until we hear from Shohei Otani. We're going to come back to you. That's right. I'm going to let you go watch it, report back. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. So, listen, Boeing tonight is hoping to turn the page on some of the safety issues plaguing the company all year with a CEO shakeup announced today. Dave Calhoun becoming the latest of three top leaders to step down. Kind of a cleaning of the house after problems that really rocked consumer confidence tanked Boeing's stock price, damaged the reputation of one of the country's biggest companies. You can see those three leaders here. Now, Calhoun is set to leave his post at the end of the year on CNBC a little bit earlier today, saying Boeing needs a serious culture shift to get on top of the issues. We have this bad habit in our company. When you move it down the line, it sends a message to your own people that, wow, I guess the movement of the airplane is more important than the first time quality of the product. And we have got to get that in way more balance. Okay, now you know what started a lot of this. That door panel that went flying off an Alaska Airlines plane mid-flight back in January. Since then, we've seen a lot of stuff. Engines, tires, wheels falling off, right? People getting hurt because of a sudden drop in altitude. Now listen, clearly, we've got to be stating this very clearly here. Obviously, not all of that can be blamed on Boeing itself versus other companies versus maybe the airlines. But the fact that people even ask these questions now, was it a Boeing issue when plane drama happens? Feels like that says a lot. NBC's Tom Costello is following this one for us. And Tom, this is huge news, right? Not just for Boeing, but for the aviation industry more broadly. You had the head of the FAA, as we reported on last week, telling NBC News that he worries about the culture around safety at the company. Is that yeah. what this is fallout from? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Keeping in mind, you mentioned the max, the MAX 9 door plug blowout in January. Prior to that, remember, we had two 737 okay. MAX 8 crashes overseas that killed 346 people. Boeing promised then it would clean up its act. It would, it would drill down on safety, on quality control, on ensuring that there were no fraudulent practices inside Boeing. And so now we see that, in fact, the board has taken action, in part because of what uh, Mike Whitaker, the CEO, the head of the FAA, said to Lester Holt last week when he said he visited Boeing. They seemed more focused on production than safety. Not a good message. And then last week, the airline CEOs, a group of them, wanted to meet with Boeing's board, but... Please, we don't want to meet with Calhoun. But not Calhoun. That's, that's a huge rebuke. Yeah, I mean, that suggests a significant loss or lack of confidence in the CEO. And as a result of that, it appears the Boeing board took action this weekend. These are the top people who run this company. Keep in mind the following. This company is 100 years old. It is an icon. Yeah. It is the biggest exporter of American products in the world. Uh, and it is a giant in terms of aviation engineering and right now it really is in trouble can i ask you about something that may be popping up you know in the group chats or for people we've seen rumblings yeah. of this before people who go well wait a second i don't really want to fly on a boeing like can i book an airbus instead on my flight you had one person telling us i just can't step on one of those boeing planes is the in the broader context of transportation safety is that an overreaction and i'm not i'm not taking a dig at that person or yeah. any of these folks who talked with us but like give us the gut check give us the reality check here uh i think it's an overreaction okay I mean, listen, in 2023, we had the safest year ever for commercial jet cra uh, jetliner performance. We didn't have a single jetliner crash anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. That's astonishing, yeah. right? Uh, you've got That's two. good news. That's, That's good. fantastic. Yes. Listen, this is what we're striving for. Some of the incidents that we highlighted here, like the wheel that fell off, that's not Boeing's That's problem. Right. That's, that's a maintenance problem. Yep. If you buy a particular brand of car and the engine falls out, 
That's the problem well, with the car the maker. But you the we're making, too, right? The fact that people even ask, uh-oh, yes. was that Boeing? We wouldn't have asked that, I don't no, think, a year or two ago. you're right. You know I what I mean? I think some of it is also collectively our fault in the media because we do start to highlight various maintenance issues that an airline has, and then we think, oh, my God, it's a Boeing, so there must be a problem with Boeing. Not really. If you buy a car and 20 years after you bought it, you got a maintenance issue because you didn't change the oil, that's not the yeah, fault of the car fault. maker. That's not your Volkswagen, fault, right? right? It's my fault. Yeah. So I do think it's important to draw a distinction yeah. there. Nonetheless, Boeing clearly is in a significant issue. The stock's down 26% year to date, and the airline CEO is going to be leaving by the, I'm sorry, the company CEO out by the end of the year. So just real quick then, who takes over? Is that the most coveted job in aviation or the most dreaded? Yes and yes. I think, seriously, that's a very tough job because the last CEO also lost his job because of the Max 8 crashes. It is a massive company. It's not just about the Max, right? Think about everything they build, including spacecraft that's right, that space. still haven't gotten to the space station. It's supposed to go next month. Uh, they've got massive issues across the entire company, cultural problems, and you're supposed to be the best engineers in the world. Tom Costello. Good luck with that. Uh, I am so glad that you are here to navigate us through the next many months of this, uh, the next year of this. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate you, you. So listen, the humanitarian crisis in Haiti is getting bigger tonight, with officials in the DR, the Dominican Republic, deporting hundreds of undocumented Haitians who tried to cross the border to get to safety, to find food, to find water. And as gang violence is spreading into new parts of Haiti's capital, the president of the Dominican Republic says he won't authorize refugee camps. Aid organizations say nearly half of the Haitian population, nearly 9 million, 5 million people, are having a tough time getting enough food to eat. Another one and a half million people are on the verge of famine. Ellison Barber is joining us now. She has made her way to the border of Haiti with the DR. Talk about what you're seeing there. What's happening behind you? Yeah, I mean, Hallie, these are mostly Haitians who have crossed into this area, this little market, a small pocket that is just on the border here. They come here because they're able to get food. They're able to find a little bit of work. And then they get it and they head back because this area closes at five. And as you were explaining so well, the Dominican Republic, they're not opening their doors to allow Haitian refugees to come in. They're temporarily allowing some to come in to get food, some items. You see people typically just carry it on their heads like this. A lot of times people will come with empty wheelbarrows in the morning, fill it up with other things that they then take back to Haiti to sell. Some people we've spoken to, we met a little boy here just the other day over the weekend. He was 13 years old. Years old. He told us where he lived in Haiti, school is still in session, excuse me, but he said that he skipped school and came here to sell candles because he needed to get money to take back to his mother and his siblings who are waiting on the other side of the border because they don't have any food at all. So people come here, they get eggs, uh, they get bananas, plantains, chicken, and then they walk oftentimes for hours to take it back because there's so little options in Haiti. When we're talking about what's happening in Haiti, we're talking about a humanitarian crisis, a security situation, and a political crisis. People are hopeful that maybe there will be a new government that is actually elected by the Haitian people and things will change. But until then, they're doing what they can to survive. And the reality here in the Dominican Republic is people who try and come here and maybe stay, they can't. We have seen even today in the last hour a bus full of Haitian migrants being taken all the way to the gate just behind us. And I can actually walk a little this way and show you some of it. Bear with us because this is a big group. This is sort of the last rush alley where people know they only have a little bit of time to get food so you can understand the desperation once we we get past five o'clock, these gates close and they have to get back out. Otherwise, they'll be arrested and deported. And we saw just in the last hour a truck full of Haitian migrants essentially in what was like a cage on top of a truck bed go all the way to, to that gate and the door was open and they were told to go home. The president of the Dominican Republic, he reiterated today that this country, he says, they do not believe that this is their problem. They do not plan at all. He said, in fact, there will never be any refugee camps in the Dominican Republic. But people are desperate right now. They want something to change in their country. But right now, they don't have very many options. And what we're seeing here is people coming just to get what they can to survive. And this last little bit, what we're seeing right now, this is that desperate push before it closes down and they can't come yeah. back here for at least until tomorrow. Hallie. I was going to ask, Allison, I'm struck by just the near constant flow of people behind you. I mean, it is unrelenting. And that is, it sounds like, partly because this is the last little crush. I mean, this is the time crunch for today until folks are able to come back tomorrow. Such mm -hmm. an ordeal. Yeah.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you can believe it, Hallie, this is actually slow. In the middle of the day, it is far busier than this of people just on foot coming and coming and coming, getting supplies and then coming back and coming back. And one of the things that is so heartbreaking is that often what we're seeing are pretty young children who yeah. are coming and they aren't in school right now because in Port-au-Prince, the gangs have closed the schools and they're trying to do what they can to help their family survive and then they go back home. But no one wants it to be like this. They want to see a change. But those negotiations for the transitional presidential council, they say they have names, CARICOM, but it hasn't moved forward in about a week. Hallie. Ellis and Barbara, we're glad to have you there. Thank you very much for bringing us those stories and for bringing us that reporting on the ground. Coming up here on the show, a lot more to get to, including the county clerk at the center of Alec Murdoch's murder trial resigning today. Why she says it's not about those accusations from the defense of jury tampering. Plus, what's going on in Paris that has hundreds of waiters racing through the streets? The county clerk accused of tampering in Alec Murdoch's murder trial and trying to sway the jury to sell more copies of the tell-all book she wrote is now resigning, effective ASAP. She kind of moved into the center of the case when Murdoch's lawyers tried unsuccessfully to use the allegations against her to get him a retrial. It didn't happen. But Becky Hill, through her attorney, suggests today her resignation is not about any of that. Listen. So let me be extremely clear. Today is not in response whatsoever to anything going on with any investigation or, or anything of that nature. Okay, and I'm going to say that one more time. Today is not in response to any new development of some investigation or anything like that. Marissa Parra is following this when she's joining us now. The world knows Becky Hill's name because of the Alec Murdoch trial. If her resignation is not about that, then what's it about? That's a great question, Hallie. And uh, there's what she says, and then there's what we can infer. So I will start by saying, for those who may not have heard Becky Hill's name, I mean, she has been the subject of a lot of specific attention, scrutiny. Some would say she has provided a lot of distractions. I mean, the fact that a county clerk is holding a press conference on her resignation alone is significant and should tell you the kind of attention that she's received um, through her time here. So Becky Hill saying herself um, that she's resigning, not seeking re-election, specifically to focus on family priorities, saying that all of this widespread public scrutiny was the major driving factor, saying it has nothing to do with the investigation. You heard her lawyer speaking for her just now there. Um, and for some context, she has held this position for four years, and she was lauded at one time by the South Carolina Attorney General's office. One of our producers here, Juliet, who's been covering this step by step um, almost throughout this entire time here, uh, has said and reminded me that the day that the verdict came down, she was on the steps outside of the courthouse, and Becky Hill was personally thanked. And so um, this is quite a fall from grace here. More recently, as we know, as we've been covering here, she has been the subject of investigations by South Carolina authorities, two investigations in particular, one into how she may have used her position, her elected position for personal financial gain. You mentioned the book there. Um, but then there was another, there has been another investigation into allegations of jury tampering. And those investigations are ongoing. They don't stop just because she announced her resignation. Um, and as you just mentioned as well, the Murdoch team did try to use this uh, as a reason to get a new trial, but the court heard from the jurors and had decided against that because they heard from the jurors. And most of the jurors had said that Becky Hill's comments were not a factor in their decision. So um, in terms of what happens next, we know the deputy clerk will take over the position in the temporary future, and then the governor is expected to appoint a new county clerk. But Hallie, mm. I think the expectation and the hope is that it will be someone one who will provide a lot less scrutiny and a lot less distractions moving forward. Marissa Parra, thank you very much. Back here to Washington tomorrow, the Supreme Court will be confronted once again with the issue, issue of abortion with justices. Hearing arguments over mifepristone, right, that's the abortion pill, as it's often called, one of two pills used in the most common kind of abortion in the country. At the center of this case, did the FDA overlook some serious safety issues when it made mifepristone easier to get, including through the mail? In a piece just out late tonight here on NBCNews.com, patient advocates and doctors now say they're worried about the potential that a dangerous precedent could be set. One OBGYN tells us restricting access could mean that most people trying to get an abortion will be affected. 
Berkeley Loveless is reporting that out. He is joining us now. We're glad to have you here, Berkeley. Mm -hmm. One of the experts that you talked to called this a uniquely important mm -hmm. case. You could argue any case that makes it to the level of the Supreme <laughs> Court is important, but why is this one so unique? Yeah, so as we previously reported, uh, medication abortion makes up nearly two-thirds of all abortions in the United States. So, And this number has been steadily rising since it was approved in 2000. And so what the Supreme Court could essentially do is roll back many of the things that the FDA has done to make this drug easier to get and easier to dispense. So that means getting it by mail, uh, not having to go into a doctor's office to, to visit, uh, many of these things that make it much easier to get. And so this could hugely limit access. And so we've already seen what this happens with states that have banned uh, medication abortion. So at least 14 states uh, have already completely banned medication abortion. And we've seen with reports that people are essentially crossing state lines uh, in order to get access to abortion care. Well, the FDA says medication abortion is safe and effective, and a lot of doctors say it's their preference as well. So what is the prep then for the potential for restrictions? And to be clear, we don't know what the Supreme Court's going to decide tomorrow. Tomorrow's just the, the oral arguments. Right. We won't know any decision until later on in the term. Right. So experts are predicting it could be a decision, a final ruling could be sometime at the end of June. Um, and so doctors are particularly concerned about their patients. We've heard about uh, doctors uh, concerned about patients with disabilities who may not be able to travel to get yeah. a medication uh, or who live too far away from a clinic who may not be able to get access to the medication. And so what I've heard is that doctors are essentially uh, stocking up on the medication mm -hmm. uh, in case there's a limit to access. I've also heard of doctors uh, just preparing to do, uh, do one medication, misoprostol. Uh, it's one of the drugs used in medication abortion. And so that's still effective, but sometimes you have to take more of the medication as well, um, which can come with unpleasant, unpleasant side effects. Um, and so uh, doctors are thinking about that as well and talking about their patients with that. Um, and so there's there's a lot of preparation going on for this potential scenario. And just really quick before I let you go, there is also potentially a broader implication that goes beyond simply abortion access. Right. And that is, you know, the argument that is being made. Did the FDA mess up by even approving it in the first place? And could that then put into the spotlight every other medication that the right. FDA approves? Right. So this, yeah, so this is uh, potentially going to affect FDA's authority on medications. And so there's fears that this could, you know, potentially impact other future approvals in the future. If it were some sort of sweeping it, ruling. Correct. We'll find out, yeah. I guess, in a few months. And the oral arguments tomorrow. Berkeley, good to see you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, police in Nashville say the death of Riley Strain continues to be accidental or continues to appear accidental, they say. Remember, we told you on Friday that the Missouri College student's body was found in a river. The initial autopsy found no evidence of anything related to foul play, but detectives are still waiting on the toxicology results. Number two, last minute decision from Pope Francis. He did not give his Palm Sunday homily yesterday. The Vatican says it was replaced with a moment of silence and a, and a prayer. We've talked about it on this show, the health issues that the Pope has struggled with, including bronchitis and the flu, but he's got a huge week here. There's a ton of stuff going on in this week before Easter. Number three, the Florida governor has signed a bill to ban social media accounts for kids under the age of 14. And if you're 14 or 15, you've got to get your parents' permission to sign up. It's supposed to take effect at the start of next year, but it's expected to be challenged in court. If it survives, it could be one of the most restrictive social media bans for kids in this country. Number four, Chick-fil-A is ditching its decade-long no antibiotics policy. Why? Because there's not enough chickens without antibiotics. So instead, Chick-fil-A says it'll serve chicken containing some antibiotics, but there's a big but. Not chicken with antibiotics important to human medicine. Remember, health officials are worried that if people eat certain antibiotics, you could be more resistant to medical treatments. So that's the line that Chick-fil-A is walking here. Number five, check it out. In Paris, a race with some of the best in the world. Is it the Olympics? Oh no, it's a bunch of servers running about a mile this weekend, <laughs> balancing all of that. Look at that, a tray with the essentials, a croissant, obviously, a coffee, a glass of water. They are serving, look at them go. They are, they are giving something. The, the race started in 1914, but hasn't been run in 13 years. It was brought back just ahead of the Olympics. I think there's a rule that says you can power walk, but you can't actually sprint. Very interesting. That's it. Listen, that's Yeoman's work right there. A lot more to get to here on the show, including when we come back, a super scary moment caught on camera in New York, how one mom fought off her daughter's attempted attacker. Oof.
NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Western Bureau, a deadly mountain lion attack in Northern California. A 21-year-old man was killed. His younger brother seriously hurt. Wildlife officials say it happened around 1 o'clock on Saturday in the afternoon. The surviving brother has had multiple surgeries but is expected to recover. The mountain lion was caught and has been euthanized. Out of our Northeast Bureau, an unbelievably scary video of the moments a man tries to kidnap an 18-year-old right outside of her apartment in New York. Look at that. Amazingly, the girl's mom hears it. She jumps into action. Look, she's running. She goes down four flights of stairs. This happened back in January, but the video is just being released. The suspect was arrested and is now facing multiple charges. He's pleaded not guilty. And out of our Southern Bureau, Miami police arresting a man after he led them on a high-speed chase. Yeah, on an ATV. On I-95, which is terrifying to even think about. At one point, he was going against traffic, which is beyond dangerous. Somehow evading police on that ATV for about an hour. Police finally stopped and arrested him more than 25 miles away from where the chase began. You're looking at that there. No word yet on what specific charges he will face. Overseas now, Russian President Vladimir Putin late today calling the four suspects who carried out that brutal attack on a Moscow concert hall, in his words, radical Islamists, while also keeping up his unfounded claims that Ukraine may be somehow involved. 137 people were killed in that attack with the suspects charged in a Russian courtroom in just the last 24 hours. These images you're looking at are disturbing. You're seeing the suspects with essentially bruised faces, uh, swelling on their faces. One of them was wheeled in on a stretcher. Matt Bodner is joining us now. He's following all of this for us. Where does this go next, Matt? Tell us more, too, about what we're hearing from President Putin here, the Russian president, as he is acknowledging now that ISIS has claimed responsibility. Thanks, Hallie. Well, <clears throat> starting with the suspects, so yes, the four were charged today. We're hearing from Russian, from the Russian media and, and the Russian you know, uh, uh, judicial system that two of them uh, did admit guilt afterwards. Now, we're getting kind of conflicting and unclear information as to whether the other two suspects uh, that were in court yesterday, today, uh, also admitted guilt. One of them, as you mentioned, did not really appear to be conscious uh, during the hearing for at least part of it. So uh, questions about that. No, they have been charged. So the next step for them uh, presumably is sentencing. They're being held now uh, until May 22nd. Uh, under pretrial protocols, uh, there is still an investigation going on. They even arrested more suspects today, three more, uh, kind of the central suspect there being the most recent owner of uh, what we're hearing was the getaway car, uh, as well as the brother and father of that former owner of the car. So uh, they also issued 12 search warrants, and we're hearing that there's maybe up to a dozen arrests in total. We just haven't seen them in court yet. So we're getting a picture, I think, uh, of an active, ongoing investigation. Uh, there, of course, are going to be a lot of questions about these confessions, uh, how they came about, the accuracy of them, just looking at uh, the state of these four suspects, Howie. And then the, the piece of it as it relates to the Ukraine blaming, right? Because Putin is acknowledging, as we said in the introduction to you, that these are, that, he, that ISIS did claim responsibility here. Correct. Yeah. So this has been an interesting factor of it the, the entire weekend. ISIS really, really wants to take credit for this, but the Russians seem to not want to give it. Uh, today, for the first time, though, we really heard Putin, you, you know, he came out with these new remarks. And, and when he came up to the topic uh, of the attack, he, he first started saying, of course, this was radical Islamist, as you mentioned. But then, you know, he, so he seemed to be walking back these claims for a second and then immediately doubled down, saying that he still was not going to rule out this uh, Kiev trace, as he's been calling it. These are the words he's been using. And again, suggested that the United States somehow uh, might have been egging this on or was somehow somehow knew about it or was complicit by trying to convince the world or at least its allies that Ukraine had nothing to do with it. But really, there's there's a strong impression from Putin's remarks that he's still trying to, to work out the details of this, Hallie. Matt Bader, we're glad to have you covering this one for us. Thank you. The big changes in the world of babysitting. How one story about teenagers ended up becoming more about parents. Christine Romans explains in tonight's Backstory. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, it's a big shift in the world of babysitting. Maybe you were one, maybe you had one, but now NBC News reporting shows some parents' attitudes toward babysitting is changing. From being pretty psyched to use, like maybe a teenager, a neighbor who's looking to make a few bucks, to now seeking out sitters with serious credentials, older, 
more experienced. Some parents even want to see babysitters with master's degrees. Listen to what one mom is telling our Christine Romans. I really want my children to feel comfortable and for my own self to feel comfortable knowing that they're left with competent, capable, very experienced people. Christine is joining us now. We're so glad to have you on a piece. Hi. Can I be honest that originated with like a conversation that you had with our team, like yeah. in a conference room? I mean, this is really yeah. because you set out to do this story about like the pack schedules of teenagers, right. all the academic pressure, cutting down on their time to babysit. But this is really more about the parents. You know, it, it really is. And it's so fascinating to me because I thought this was about kids building a resume and they didn't have the time to, you know, take care of their, you know, snot-nosed neighbor kid. But that's not what it is at all here. Look, Care.com even says they begin uh, screening people at the age of 18. So 18 years and up. And Care.com, of course, is a, is a central place to find uh, babysitters. And we talk with a babysitter, somebody who's been babysitting since she was 13. She's 20 now. And she said she's noticed that parents are more comfortable with her as she's gotten older with more skills. Listen. I feel like adults are more likely to trust and reach out to older babysitters than they are younger ones. They feel like it's safer for their child. When I was younger, obviously, I had a lot more restrictions. Like, I couldn't drive. Now that I can drive, um, we can go and explore the towns or do whatever they might want to do. So I think both things are happening. Kids are building a resume in high school, right? And they're not really babysitting as much. At the same time, parents aren't looking for young teenagers to babysit their kids as much. What do you think that means for the teens, right? I think about I was a babysitter when I was younger. You, I know, were a, a teenage oh, yeah. babysitter as well. I mean, that's also like life experience. It's about showing up on time. It's about being responsible. It's about, you know, figuring out f even finances, right? Budgets, getting the cash from the mom or the dad on your way out the door. <laughs> I became a capitalist because of babysitting. I'm telling you right now. I started to realize, like, the, the, the twins are going to be not as uh, lucrative as the one kid who I know is going to take two naps. You know, like, you start to figure out... <laughs> which which is the best uh, babysitting uh, job to take. But I think it's really interesting. You know, we talk to a lot of different kids. Oh, a 13-year-old, for example, who's been doing this, or she's 16 now. She's been doing it since she was 13. Um, and she's really sort of growing and gaining money and understanding how to use money. But I'll tell you something interesting. In my day, you know, my parents got a teenage babysitter on the weekend. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. Today, a lot of people are two-income families, and guess what they do on the weekends? They do stuff with their kids. That's you know, such a good point. They, they spend more time with their kids, or their kids are already in daycare, so they're not getting a babysitter on the weekend. And it also varies, like, depending on where you live, I would think, right? I mean, I think there are some differences based on your community, based on your neighborhood. Like, I know in my totally. friend group, my mom group, it's actually hard to find a babysitter, teen or not, period, on a Saturday night. Yeah, that's absolutely true. It depends on where you are. And the pay is really varied all over the place, too. Like, out here on the East Coast, babysitters get a lot higher pay um, because a lot of times they're competing with nannies in some cases, you know, who are more than happy to do <laughs> extra hours. Um, and in the Midwest, maybe they pay a little bit less, but there's more availability. It all kind of depends on where you are. But that, you, you know, that, that rite of passage, it's not quite as entrenched as it used to be. Christine Romans, uh, it makes me think of the Babysitter's Club books that I read religiously totally. when I was a teenager, too. Thank totally. you so much. <laughs> Fascinating conversation. Glad to have you on for the backstory. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage on a busy breaking news day picking up right now. Feds raiding the homes of Diddy on both coasts. What we're learning literally minute by minute about a potential sex trafficking investigation that may have set off some of the dramatic scenes you're seeing right here. We're going to take you live to L.A. We're also going to take you live to big news in baseball because in just the last 10 minutes, we've heard from the sport's biggest star speaking for the first time about the gambling scandal swirling around him. Why Shohei, Shohei Otani is now calling his longtime interpreter a thief and a liar in so many words. Plus, the legal can kick down the road for Donald Trump, with the former president getting a win for now in at least one of the cases against him. What a delay in one trial and a better payment schedule in another means for Mr. Trump's complicated web of legal issues. Matt, whoever said spring has sprung is not looking at this weather. Our team is breaking down the snow, the rain, the overall misery of it all affecting millions right now. And Boeing hoping a CEO shakeup can settle some turbulence. What's ahead for whoever will lead the company next? Is it the most coveted or the most dreaded job in aviation? That's later in the show.
Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight we've got a dramatic situation unfolding in L.A. and Miami Beach at the homes of Sean Diddy Combs. You know him as Diddy, formerly Puff Daddy. You've got the feds raiding his houses in both locations. This is the split screen, and I'm looking. This is live. You are looking live right now at helicopters above his homes, again, East Coast and West Coast. At one point in L.A., agents entered holding what appeared to be guns, executing this warrant. Now, remember, Combs, according to what sources are telling NBC News, is the subject of a federal investigation. This is all coming on the heels of a wave of civil lawsuits against the rap star over the past few months. In November, Cassandra Ventura, also known as the singer Cassie, who used to date Combs, accused him of abuse and rape and then settled with him the next day on terms that have not been disclosed. Not long after, three other women filed lawsuits against him in New York, making similar accusations. Then, just last month, the producer on Combs' latest album, accusing him of sexual harassment and assault. Now, we should note that Diddy, Sean Combs, denies all of the allegations. Dana Griffin is following this one for us. So we're seeing these live pictures coming in tonight. It is news that is uh, dramatic, to say the least. What else do we know? Yeah. Yeah. Hallie, this has been going on for at least the last couple of hours uh, at least here in Los Angeles. A source familiar with the matter tells NBC News that three women and a man have already been interviewed by the Southern District of New York in relation to sex trafficking, sexual assault, and the solicitation and distribution of illegal narcotics and firearms, again, related to Sean Diddy Combs. The source also says three additional women have interviews scheduled. So we now know that he is the subject of this investigation. So far, we've seen investigators going in with several cardboard boxes. So that tells us that there are several items that they are likely looking for. And this has gone now from that civil, from several civil cases to now a federal investigation. So Hallie, this is extremely serious. And as you mentioned, you know, there have been several sexual assault lawsuits filed against Combs in recent months, including a lawsuit from former, from his former girlfriend and R&B singer Cassie. And that was settled last year. Another of Combs' accusers was a woman who said that the rap producer raped her two decades ago when she was just 17 years old. We have yet to hear from Sean Diddy Combs himself. We still don't know his whereabouts. We know that he was in Los Angeles, seen in Los Angeles several days ago. We are working to get new developments. But I want to read you just some some of the, the, the statements that we have received so far, including from investigators who confirmed that this is an HSI Homeland Security investigation. They said that it executed a law enforcement action in, in, in New York as part of, or excuse me, in Miami and Los Angeles. This is part of a New York investigation. And also I want to read you part of the statement that we got from Cassie's lawyer. They issued that just moments ago in light of this raid. It reads in part that they will, that they are, they are, they say this, was hopeful. This is hopefully the beginning of a process that will hold Mr. Combs responsible for his depraved conduct. They add that they will always support law enforcement when it seeks to prosecute those that have violated the law. So obviously a very a, a full, a, a developing situation right now as we learn new details and we hope to find out pretty soon where Combs is located. Hallie. Dana Griffin, thank you very much. I know you're going to be watching all of this develop over the next couple of hours as it's earlier where you are in the West Coast. Maybe we'll get more as the night goes on. Thank you. Yeah. Also out West, we have just heard from Dodgers superstar Shohei Otani, who says he has never bet on baseball with a huge gambling scandal swirling around him and specifically around his interpreter. Listen. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I wanted to be here uh, today to be able to talk. Uh, I'm sure it was very tough. It's been a tough week for fans and team officials, and I'm very grateful that the media has been patience, patient in this process. Uh, just on a personal note, uh, I'm very saddened and shocked that someone who I'm trusted has done this. So I never bet on baseball or any other sports, or never have asked somebody to do it on my behalf, uh, and I have never uh, went through a bookmaker uh, to bet on sports. Okay, so that's obviously Otani and an interpreter there, a different interpreter than the one who was fired last week with these allegations of stealing money, basically, of illegal gambling. So Otani, remember, the big question for Otani, was this money stolen from him, from him? Did he lend it to his interpreter? Otani is making clear tonight that it was stolen. He says his interpreter has told lies. I want to bring David Noriega in, who is joining us now. Again, this all happened in just the last literally 16 minutes or so. What else did he say? Was it enough? What's your sense? 
Hallie, I was actually surprised by how kind of substantive and complete and direct this statement was. You know, I, I was expecting something like, there are investigations that mm. I'm cooperating with and I can't say very much other than that. But no, he actually gave a very clear version of his account of things, which is the version of events that says that Ipe simply stole this money from him, that he was not aware that this money was being stolen until just a few days ago, and that he was not aware of any of this until basically Ipe brought it to his attention. You know, there, there's the bit that you played at the top there where he says very clearly, this is the question everyone was asking themselves, he says, he addresses it directly and clearly. I have never bet on baseball or any other sports. That's the first thing everyone was asking themselves. The other thing that really stood out to me is that he says that the day that he found out about all of this, when, when, um, when they were just playing in Korea, he says that Ipe admitted to him in a one-on-one -on -one meeting in their hotel, admitted to him that he was sending money to the bookmaker using his account. So he claims that Mizuhara, Ipe Mizuhara, his interpreter, uh, came clean to him and basically said, I've been stealing money from you, taking mm. it directly from your account and wiring it to this illegal bookie in Orange County. Now, the, the reason that this was really confusing and complicated for a while is because Mizuhara, the interpreter, initially had a version of events that said that Otani lent him this money to bail, him, right. to bail him out of this gambling debts. But, but the reason it's extra confusing, Hallie, is because Otani's reps, his the, like PR crisis firm that he hired and, and the people who were representing him, initially backed up that claim in interviews with ESPN and then retracted it, right? So it wasn't just Mizuhara who changed his story. It was actually Otani's reps themselves. What Otani is saying now is that he wasn't involved in any of that. He himself didn't become aware of any of this until there was this sort of confusing meeting in the in the Dodgers clubhouse in Seoul where he realized that Mizuhara was talking about something sketchy and then he kind of confronted him about it and was like, what is this? And then yeah. Mizuhara admits to him, like, I've been stealing millions of dollars from you. Um, look, if this was... The, the question of whether this was theft or not, I think should be answerable with a, a sort of, you know, federal criminal investigation. This is the kind of thing that, like, forensics, like, there are wire transfers. It, it should be possible to answer that question. Obviously, the investigation has to run its course. We're not going to know the answer to that question anytime soon. But I do think that Otani, in this press conference, gave enough detailed information with enough clarity and enough substance that it should, we at least know what his position is now. And that should... I think puts some of the speculation to bed. Howie? And because this was speculation that was overshadowing to such a degree, MLB's opening week, right? Dodgers opening day coming up in just a few days. I mean, this was like a huge, this is not just like an LA Dodgers story. It is a broader yeah. baseball story. And one of the questions, I mean, again, this is an interpreter, Ipe, as you say, who is alongside Otani constantly. I mean, every picture of Shohei Otani also had a picture of his interpreter in it as well, it seems. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but not by much, right? I mean, these two were in so many ways tied at the hip. There is an inherent trust, too, that comes with somebody who is quite literally translating the words for somebody else, right? Like, there is an inherent level of trust there. And I think one of the questions that we had talked about actually last week when the story first came out, or maybe it was earlier, I guess it was last week, was, you know, Otani... There had been no allegation that he had bet on baseball illegally, and he's making very clear that absolutely did not happen. That's what he's been saying. That's right. A again, he came out in very, very clearly, unambiguously said yeah. that. I, I think you're right that because this was a really big liability, particularly the information void and the murkiness and the speculation was a big liability, not just for Otani, not just for the Dodgers, but for all of Major League Baseball. I, I'm sure he was under a lot of pressure to come out and say something clearly. Uh, the, you know, the other thing I would say is his relationship with Mizuhara, they were very close friends by all accounts. It is surprising, I guess not impossible to conceive of, but it is surprising that he would have been able to keep the secret from his good friend for so long, mm. this crippling gambling addiction that ran up to the tune of, you know, millions of dollars. But stranger things have happened, Allie. David Noriega, boy, it is an avalanche of news here tonight. Thank you for bringing us some of it. Appreciate it. Also an avalanche out east with multiple developments for former President Trump in a place he used to call home, New York, with a trial now set in at least one of the criminal cases against him before Election Day. As it all is going down today, Mr. Trump is repeating his usual claims with no evidence that these cases, he says, are politically motivated. We're going through this weaponization of our government to try and knock out somebody's political opponent. And so far, based on the polls, it's not working at all. The people understand it. I don't know how you can have a trial that's going on right in the middle of an election. Not fair. Not fair. 
Well, we'll see about the timing. We'll get to that in a second. But let's keep in mind what went down today. Things playing out differently than expected. Because two big things, right? Two big things were supposed to happen today. First, it was supposed to be day one of the former president's first criminal trial on the hush money case against him. I know you remember that. That's when this Manhattan DA is accusing Mr. Trump of lying on business records related to this hush money payout, allegedly $130,000, to keep Stormy Daniels quiet about her alleged affair with Mr. Trump during the 2016 presidential election. Mr. Trump denies it. Now, also today, there was this big deadline for former President Trump to put up nearly half a billion dollars in bond for a civil fraud verdict, separate case. That was the expectation. That's what was supposed to happen. Here's what really happened. We got a new trial date, April 15th, that a judge has set for that criminal trial. And in the civil trial, the civil fraud side of things, I should say, the former president's getting more time to pay less money. He now has 10 days to post $175 million. Garrett Hake is in New York. Laura Jarrett is live for us with the legal angle. I think you, what do you call it, Garrett? The legal firm of Garrett and Jarrett? Because that's what we got tonight, breaking this one down for us. One of the things that you like to say often is that there is no such thing as two separate lanes for Donald Trump. There is no such thing as a legal lane and a political lane. It is all the same lane, and that was in pretty stark relief today. No, we're fine, we're fine, we're fine. Don't touch me. Yeah, Hallie, and just for the record, I think it's Jared and Garrett. It just sounds better that way. But I will say this is a perfectly good example. That's okay. That's okay. We're still working on our signage and business cards. But look, I think this is a perfect example of the way in which Donald Trump's campaign and the legal elements have all melded together in such a way that they really can't be separated. He's not doing public events. He's not talking about much of anything else. He's certainly not on his social media platform. And he's based all of his fundraising around this idea that he's being victimized here. But I think what we saw today was Trump get a little bit of breathing room when he had otherwise been essentially cornered, it seemed, legally speaking. Today, in addition to those comments about, you know, kind of attacking these cases as somehow Biden based, which doesn't even really make sense when you're talking about state cases and a president, uh, you know, the federal system here. We heard a lot of talk about cash and about money and about what Mr. Trump says he might do with the money that is suddenly more available to him than it was 24 hours ago. Here's a little bit of what he had to say about that with a fact check on the other side. You know, the bond's been reduced. Are you going to start putting money into your campaign? Yeah. You haven't done that since yeah. 2016. Well, first of all, it's none of your business, I mean, frankly. But uh, I might. I might do that. I have the option. But if I have to spend $500 million on a bond, I wouldn't have that option. I'd have to start selling things. The reality is Donald Trump has not put any money into his campaign since 2016, and then he later converted that money to a loan and paid himself back from the money he was getting from his supporters. And so I think this speaks to the idea of Donald Trump, the rich guy, kind of central to his political mythology. It was important to project that again today, having dodged a bullet with a bill he could not have paid, now suggesting the money's fine, no big deal, on we go. Garrett, super quick. I know you got to go over to Knightley in one second here, but April 15th for that criminal trial start date for at least jury selection to begin, that would put Donald Trump in New York, right? Not exactly like a well-known swing state. How does that affect his campaign rally situation? Well, look, the, the nice thing for Trump is the timing here, because if you start in mid-April, you go through perhaps the end of May. That's typically a relatively slow time in the presidential yeah. campaign calendar. Most candidates are focused on fundraising during that time period anyway, having already locked up the nomination. And I would argue that standing in the hallway of the courthouse behind me or down the street at 40 Wall Street, where the former president spoke today, he could probably get just as much, if not more, media coverage than he could at a high-skilled gymnasium oh. in Sheboygan or at a fly-in rally in Georgia. So the options will still be available to him to campaign on the weekends, and the spotlight will be right here on New York City. I see both Sheboygan and Georgia in your future in a few months. Garrett Hake, live for us in New York. Thank you. We'll look for you on nightly. Uh, the other half now of our legal team, Laura Jarrett, is joining us now. Because if there is an umbrella theme, I think, to today as it relates to former President Trump, it is he bought himself a little bit more time on both these fronts. He did, though, Hallie. Although I have to say, the April 15th date, this judge really does seem to want it to be set in stone. The only reason okay. this case is not starting today, Hallie, is because the defense team had accused the prosecutors of something really serious that the judge said he essentially felt like had been wasted for his time. He, they had been accused of prosecutorial misconduct for withholding 
withholding documents related to a key witness, Michael Cohen, who we're all familiar with. The judge heard a lot of argument, a lot of finger-pointing about that today, and basically found it all unfounded. And at the end of it, essentially said, I don't even know why we're here. He's finding this odd. So he said, I'm going to see you on April 15th. And I did not get any indication that the judge appears to be at all interested in moving that trial date. Of course, the former president is very, very focused on this civil fraud trial. It's not a criminal mm -hmm. case, but it is his namesake company. It is his control. He called it his babies today in a true social post. And now he got essentially the relief of a lifetime by not having to offer up that more than $500, $450 million nut that he was going to have to front yeah. himself, Hallie. He could find no lender who was willing to give him that serious amount of cash. It's not like $175 million is pennies on the dollar right. for, like, most normal human beings, but it's certainly not half a billion, Laura, to your point here. You know, the other thing is, just to talk about this idea of the April 15th trial date or jury selection to begin in this hush money trial, that is the one, and you and I have talked about this over the course of many months here, that it seems legal experts think, and frankly, some political observers, could be the least impactful for former President Trump. And yet, that is the one, as you look at the, the array of criminal cases against him, that seems, of course, most likely to wrap up before Election Day, maybe even before the Republican convention. In some ways, it's, you know, it was the first filed, and it appears to be the first to go, even if the facts are all well known, even if legally it's not perhaps the most sophisticated, even if it's state versus federal, at the end of the day, it's realistically the one that's going. All the other ones are bogged down in delays. Some of them don't even have real trial dates right now. Mm. Um, and so I think everybody should kind of get their heads around the fact that this is the one that's going to trial. And it's still historic. We have never seen a former president have to sit in a courtroom for the better part of six weeks in the middle of an election year where he is facing a potential felony here in New York, Hallie. Laura Jarrett, live for us with a lot, a lot to juggle today. We'll look for more of your reporting on Nightly Tonight. Laura, thanks. To weather now and bad weather happening really all over the map. Snow, wind, storms, maybe even tornadoes with this huge spring system moving through the Midwest. Some spots that got snow, more than a foot of it coming down in some places, now getting soaked with rain instead. Out West, take a look at this dramatic rescue. First responders pulling up a woman out of the L.A. River after she fell in during a storm. Down South, you've got millions bracing for some of the alerts stretching into the night. Our team is all over this. Meteorologist Bill Karens standing by with the possible tornado threat. Jesse Kirsch in Minneapolis looking, can I say this, friend? Looking pretty Miz. That's disgusting, and I'm sorry. <laughs> Hallie, I, I don't know if I can even say anything to match that, so I may as well just toss it back to you. But here's the deal. We woke up, we had some rain, then we had some snow, then it went back to rain here. Uh, we are expecting more snow in the Twin Cities potentially tomorrow, but potentially the bigger concern here is we've got a lot of standing water around now. You've got all these puddles. You can see the, the, the drip off the side of this awning where our crew is staying dry. Um, and that can lead to ice, which then can lead to its own set of hazards. So there's that concern here in the Twin Cities. But across the plains, we continue to see a good amount of snow today, as much as 12 inches over a foot uh, in some areas in Colorado and Wisconsin and here in Minnesota. And I mentioned that we're expecting more snow in the Twin Cities tomorrow. And this is just one part of the country experiencing uh, some winter weather headaches carrying over into spring. And we're not through this yet, as I know Bill will talk about in a second. Uh, it's across multiple stretches of the country that we're still seeing these weather headaches tonight, Hallie. Okay, Jesse, uh, thank you much. I'll let you go get inside. Our thanks to your crew as well. Bill Karens, you heard that toss from Jesse, candidly, the threat of tornadoes. What's the deal? Because we know that as the sun goes down, as we start to head into the night, that's when it's really sort of the scary moment. Are people going to hear alerts if there is a tornado, et cetera? Yeah, the threat exists, but it doesn't look ominous. So that's okay. the good that's news. Good. So, yeah, we you know, in the springtime, from here on out, we're going to get a lot of severe weather events. It's just that time of year. You know, at tornado season peaks in May, by the way. April is the second most. June's the third most. So we're getting into that season. And sometimes they overachieve and sometimes they underachieve. Mm -hmm. Right now, tonight looks like an underachiever. And that's fantastic. We'll take it. So this is the area that we've been concerned with all day long. The yellow shows a slight risk. The orange is a higher risk, a more concentrated risk of where the storms would be.
So they're forming now in Louisiana and through southern uh, Arkansas. And then tonight, they're going to head into Mississippi. So we still have a ways to go with this. But we just didn't get the re air mass recovery. It was kind of cloudy. Sometimes you actually need the sun's energy to you get the fuel to the atmosphere to get these big storms. If it's cloudy all day, it's actually a good thing. And that happened for a good portion of the day. So we still have this hatched area. The air mass, the air itself is spinning. So if we get storms that form, they could spin and drop a big tornado. But we just haven't had really big storms forming yet. And that's good again. So we've had this line of thunderstorms, but we haven't had what we call discrete thunderstorms. Thunderstorms add ahead of this line. Those are the supercells. Those are the ones we would be concerned with. Earlier, we were watching Alexandria. We did have a severe thunderstorm warning with this, but that has now been dropped. So right now, no tornado warnings, none reported. And hopefully we'll keep it that way as we go through the evening. The other problems, obviously, the storm is still powerful over the top of Omaha sitting here. And behind it, we still have snow. It's still a treacherous drive through western Kansas and Interstate 70. 80 is not fun either through Nebraska. Blizzard warnings continue in these areas. And later on tonight, as the storm moves northwards, that snow is going to return to areas that were rain today, like where Jesse was there in Minneapolis. So as far as the snowfall, additional tomorrow. And this is going to be another slap in the face. This purple is nine inches from Duluth Yikes. to just outside the Twin Cities. So, yes, not done yet. Three days in a row of stormy weather for our friends in the Plains. All right. Well, we're sending them lots of sunshine vibes. Yeah. Bill Karens, thank you very much. To business now. And Boeing tonight hoping to turn the page on some of the safety issues plaguing the company all year with a CEO shakeup announced today. Dave Calhoun becoming the latest of three top leaders to step down. He's the biggest name in what's kind of a cleaning of the house after problems that rocked consumer confidence, tanked Boeing's stock price, and damaged the reputation of one of the country's biggest companies. Calhoun will leave his post at the end of the year. We learned today, and he was on CNBC today, saying Boeing needs a serious culture shift to try to get on top of some of the issues. We have this bad habit in our company. When you move it down the line, it sends a message to your own people that, wow, I guess the movement of the airplane is more important than the first time quality of the product. And we have got to get that in way more balance. Now, you know, the biggest headline from this, of course, what started this was that door panel flying off an Alaska Airlines plane mid-flight. Now, since then, there have been some other issues, not all Boeing-related. You know, flames from engines, tires and wheels falling off, people hurt after the sudden drop in altitude on a LATAM flight. Again, to be clear, not all of that can be blamed on Boeing itself versus other companies, versus airlines, et cetera, right? It's not all Boeing's fault, but the fact that people even ask the question, is it a Boeing issue when plane stuff happens? That says a lot about where the company is right now. NBC's Tom Costello is joining us now. Tom, this is huge news, right? Not just for Boeing, but for the aviation industry more broadly. You had the head of the FAA, as we reported on last week, telling NBC News that he worries about the culture around safety at the company. Is that yeah. what this is fallout from? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Keeping in mind, you mentioned the max, the MAX 9 door plug blowout in January. Prior to that, remember, we had two 737 MAX 8 crashes overseas that killed 346 people. Boeing promised then it would clean up its act. It would, it would drill down on safety, on quality control, on ensuring that there were no fraudulent practices inside Boeing. And so now we see that, in fact, the board has taken action, in part because of what uh, Mike Whitaker, the the CEO, the head of the FAA, said to Lester Holt last week when he said he visited Boeing, they seemed more focused on production than safety. Not a good message. And then last week, the airline CEOs, a group of them, wanted to meet with Boeing's board, but please, we don't want to meet with Calhoun. Not Calhoun, that's, that's a huge rebuke. Yeah, I mean, that suggests a significant loss or lack of confidence in the CEO. And as a result of that, it appears the Boeing's board took action this weekend. These are the top people who run this company. Keep in mind the following. This company is 100 years old. It is an icon. Yeah. It is the biggest exporter of American products in the world. Uh, and it is a giant in terms of aviation engineering and right now it really is in trouble can i ask you about something that may be popping up you know in the group chats or for people we've seen rumblings yeah. of this before people who go well wait a second i don't really want to fly on a boeing like can i book an airbus instead on my flight you had one person telling us i just can't step on one of those boeing planes is the in the broader context of transportation safety is that an overreaction and i'm not i'm not taking a dig at that person or yeah. any of these folks who talked with us but like give us the gut check give us the reality check here uh i think it's an overreaction okay I mean, listen, in 2023, we had the safest year ever for commercial jet, uh, jet liner 
performance. We didn't have a single jetliner crash anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. That's astonishing, yeah. right? Uh, you've got That's two. good news. That's, That's good. fantastic. Yes. Listen, this is what we're striving for. Some of the incidents that we highlighted here, like the wheel that fell off, that's not Boeing's That's problem. Right. That's, that's a maintenance problem. Yep. If you buy a particular brand of car and the engine falls out, that's the problem well, with the car maker. you get the point maker. we're making, too, right? The fact that people even ask, uh-oh, yes. was that Boeing? We wouldn't have asked that, I don't no, think, a year or two ago. No, you're right. You know I what I mean? I think some of it is also collectively our fault in the media because we do start to highlight various maintenance issues that an airline has, and then we think, oh, my God, it's a Boeing, so there must be a problem with Boeing. Not really. If you buy a car and 20 years after you bought it, you got a maintenance issue because you didn't change the oil, that's not the yeah, fault of the car fault. maker. That's not your fault, right? right? It's my fault. Yeah. So I do think it's important to draw a distinction yeah. there. Nonetheless, Boeing clearly is in a significant issue. The stock's down 26% year to date, and the airline CEO is going to be leaving by the, I'm sorry, the company CEO out by the end of the year. So just real quick then, who takes over? Is that the most coveted job in aviation or the most dreaded? Yes and yes. I think, seriously, that's a very tough job because the last CEO also lost his job because of the Max 8 crashes. It is a massive company. It's not just about the Max, right? Think about everything they build, including spacecraft that's right, that space. still haven't gone to the space station. It's supposed to go next month. Uh, they've got massive issues across the entire company, cultural problems, and you're supposed to be the best engineers in the world. Tom Costello. Good luck with that. Uh, I am so glad that you are here to navigate us through the next many months of this, uh, the next year of this. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate you, you. To Haiti now and the humanitarian crisis there that is getting worse and worse, even as we speak, with officials in the Dominican Republic deporting hundreds of undocumented Haitians who have tried to cross the border for safety, to get help, to get food, to get water. And as gang violence is spreading into new parts of the Haitian capital, the president of the DR says he will not authorize refugee camps. Aid organizations say nearly half of Haiti's population, nearly 5 million people, are having trouble feeding themselves. Another 1.5 million are on the verge of famine. Ellison Barber is joining us now from right on the Haitian border in the DR. Talk about what you're seeing there. What's happening behind you? Yeah, I mean, Hallie, these are mostly Haitians who have crossed into this area, this little market, a small pocket that is just on the border here. They come here because they're able to get food, they're able to find a little bit of work, and then they get it and they head back because this area closes at 5. And as you were explaining so well, the Dominican Republic, they're not opening their doors to allow Haitian refugees to come in. They're temporarily allowing some to come in to get food, some items. You see, people typically just carry it on their heads like this. A lot of times people will come with empty wheelbarrows in the morning, fill it up with other things that they then take back to Haiti to sell. Some people we've spoken to, we met a little boy here just the other day over the weekend. He was 13 years old. He told us where he lived in Haiti, school is still in session, excuse me, but he said that he skipped school and came here to sell candles because he needed to get money to take back to his mother and his siblings who are waiting on the other side of the border because they don't have any food at all. So people come here, they get eggs, uh, they get bananas, plantains, chicken, and then they walk oftentimes for hours to take it back because there's so little options in Haiti. When we're talking about what's happening in Haiti, we're talking about a humanitarian crisis, a security situation, and a political crisis. People are hopeful that maybe there will be a new government that is actually elected by the Haitian people and things will change. But until then, they're doing what they can to survive. And the reality here in the Dominican Republic is people who try and come here and maybe stay, they can't. We have seen even today in the last hour, a bus full of Haitian migrants being taken all the way to the gate just behind us. And I can actually walk a little this way and show you some of it. Bear with us because this is a big group. This is sort of the last rush alley where people know they only have a little bit of time to get food. So you can understand the desperation once we we get past five o'clock, these gates close and they have to get back out. Otherwise, they'll be arrested and deported. And we saw just in the last hour a truck full of Haitian migrants essentially in what was like a cage on top of a truck bed go all the way to, to that gate and the door was open and they were told to go home. The president of the Dominican Republic, he reiterated today that this country, he says, they do not believe that this is their problem. They do not plan at all. He said, in fact, there will never be any refugee camps in the Dominican Republic, but people are desperate right now. They want something to change in their country, but right now they don't have very many options. And what we're seeing here is people coming just to get what they can to survive. And this last little bit, what we're seeing right now, this is that desperate push before it closes down. And 
they can't come yeah. back here for at least until tomorrow. Hallie. I was going to ask, Ellison, I'm struck by just the near constant flow of people behind you. I mean, it is unrelenting, and that is, it sounds like, partly because this is the last little crush. I mean, this is the time crunch for today until folks are able to come back tomorrow. Such mm -hmm. an ordeal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you can believe it, Hallie, this is actually slow. In the middle of the day, it is far busier than this of people just on foot coming and coming and coming, getting supplies and then coming back and coming back. And one of the things that is so heartbreaking is that often what we're seeing are pretty young children who yeah. are coming and they aren't in school right now because in Port-au-Prince, the gangs have closed the schools and they're trying to do what they can to help their family survive and then they go back home. But no one wants it to be like this. They want to see a change. But those negotiations for the Transitional Presidential Council, they say they have names, CARICOM, but it hasn't moved forward in about a week. Hallie? Ellis and Barbara, we're glad to have you there. Thank you very much for bringing us those stories and for bringing us that reporting on the ground. Still ahead, the clerk at the center of Alec Murdoch's murder trial resigning rather abruptly, why she says it has nothing to do with those accusations of jury tampering. Plus, celebrating the Festival of Color. Look at that, how people across India are welcoming in spring today. That's in The Global. We'll be right back. The county clerk accused of tampering in Alec Murdoch's murder trial and trying to sway the jury to sell more copies of the tell-all book she wrote is now resigning, effective immediately. She moved to kind of the center of the whole case when Murdoch's lawyers tried to use the allegations against her to get him a retrial. That was not successful. With Becky Hill today saying through her lawyer her resignation is not about any of that. Watch. So let me be extremely clear. Today is not in response whatsoever to anything going on with any investigation or, or anything of that nature. Okay, and I'm going to say that one more time. Today is not in response to any new development of some investigation or anything like that. Marissa Parra is following all of it for us. She is joining us now. Explain then why she is deciding to step down right now. Hey, Hallie. So uh, Becky Hill saying she's resigning and not seeking re-election so she could focus on her family, really direct her priorities there, saying the widespread public scrutiny was a major factor in her decision. Here's a little bit of what she had to say earlier. I look forward to all of the future holds and will fondly remember the true amazing friendships that I have made while serving the incredible people of Colleton County. And so, as we fix our eyes forward, I would like to announce also that my resignation as clerk of court will be effective immediately. Thank you. And Hallie, you heard her lawyer going through great lengths to stress that this has nothing to do with the investigations that remain ongoing, by the way. Um, and she has been the subject of a lot of attention, a lot of scrutiny, and arguably has been a, a large distraction here. And the fact that a county clerk is holding a press conference to announce her resignation is also yeah. pretty significant here. She has had this position for four years, for those who don't know, and she has been previously lauded, widely lauded, by the South Carolina Attorney General's office. And for those who may not remember, I want to show you this this image from the day the verdict came down. It is striking. Um, these images of everyone turning back to look at her, to thank her, clapping for her, everyone smiling. So this really illustrates what has clearly mm. become a very fall, far from grace, uh, far fall from grace. Um, more recently, we talked about these investigations. She has been under investigation by South Carolina authorities for two things, uh, specifically looking at whether or not an elected, elected position was being used for personal financial gain, as well as an investigation into allegations of jury tampering. And as we mentioned, these are ongoing. They don't just go away because she resigned. Um, now, there were attempts from Murdoch's team to use this, these investigations, to get a new trial. Uh, but the court heard from the jurors and decided that that wasn't necessary. Uh, most of the jurors had said that no comments from Hill, uh, Hill was no, in no way uh, shaped their decision to find him guilty. And so that was dismissed. But now, right now, the, the big part of this is the search is on for her replacement. And as that continues, we know the deputy clerk is going to be assuming a temporary position, but um, obviously the hope here that whoever assumes this position and takes over for her will not provide the same distractions. Hallie? Yes, perhaps lower profile. Boris Ampara, thank you so much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the White House says it's disappointed that the Israeli prime minister pulled a delegation of high-level leaders that he was going to send to the U.S., it's a pretty dramatic retaliation after the U.S. did not veto a ceasefire resolution passed by the U.N. Security Council demanding an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza during Ramadan. 
with the U.S. abstaining from mostly ceremonial vote instead of vetoing like it has in the past. Israel now saying any chance of a deal to get hostages out and actually stop the fighting is about 50-50. Number two, King Charles' nephew says the king is hugely frustrated about how long it's taking him to recover from cancer. He says the king was in good spirits after he was diagnosed fat back in February, but that he's struggling now with stepping back as he recovers. Number three, HBO reportedly delaying season three of Euphoria. It wasn't going to premiere until 2025, but now HBO says they're still writing scripts and will let their cast, a bunch of superstars, do some other things in the meantime. Number four, next Powerball drawings in a few hours. Somebody could win really big. You know our rule here. We don't talk about lotto unless it's worth your while. And at this point, it's $800 million. And with Mega Millions at $1.1 billion, it means the combined jackpot is close to the combined jackpot, I should say, is close to $2 billion. Fine. That hits the bar. That's a big deal. That's a lot of lotto right there, right? As always, I feel compelled to remind you, the odds are not in your favor, but good luck. And if you win, remember me. You're realist. All right, number five. <laughs> good luck. Is this the Paris Olympics? No. It is the Paris waiters race, apparently. Look at all these servers. They're carrying the coffee, the glass of water. Yes, that's a croissant on the tray as well. They're racing through the city. Look at them go. They are serving. Yes, the race started in 1914. It hasn't been run in 13 years, but was brought back pre-Olympics. A lot of medals to be given out for that. But you know what? Any server deserves a medal for what they do and the work that they do. There you go. Coming up, a ton of doctors in South Korea are stepping down. We'll tell you why and what it means for the hospitals there. Plus, what Russian President Vladimir Putin is now calling the suspects in the mass concert shooting. Next. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because it is tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's a look at what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Ecuador, police say the country's youngest mayor and one of her staffers, her communications director, were shot and killed over the weekend. Remember, the president declared a state of emergency in January because of a surge in gang violence there. Police think the two were killed inside their rental car. They're investigating. Out of South Korea, top doctors are now submitting resignations to support thousands of interns and residents who have been on strike for weeks. they have been telling me about this. They're protesting the government's plan to boost the number of med students. Officials say they need more doctors to care for the country's population, which is getting older. And out of India, millions of people across the country are taking this to the streets. Look at this. It's the holy celebrations, the Hindu festival of colors all across the country. People getting together, they dance, they sing, and then, of course, there's the powder in all different bright colors. It's just gorgeous. The celebration marks the beginning of spring. Also overseas, Russian President Vladimir Putin late today calling the four suspects who carried out the brutal attack on a Moscow concert hall, in his words, radical Islamists, while also keeping up his unfounded claims that Ukraine is somehow involved. 137 people were killed in that attack. But those suspects charged in a Russian courtroom in the last 24 hours. We're going to show you some of those images. We have to warn you, they are disturbing. You can see all of the suspected gunmen are looking like they're very badly beaten with bruising and swelling on their faces. One of them was even wheeled in on a stretcher. Matt Bodner is following all of this. He is joining us now. So in addition to giving us the latest here, talk us through the Putin of it all, right? Because he is now acknowledging, it seems, more and more the ISIS claim of responsibility for this attack. Well, that's right, Hallie. It was a very, I think, interesting statement from President Putin today. Uh, just some background on it. Uh, he'll occasionally just televise what appear to be ordinary meetings with, you know, a, a conference call uh, with various ministers. That's where this came up, and it'll just go on Russian television. Uh, in it today, of course, as you mentioned, he, he finally used the word radical Islam to, to describe these attackers. And there was, you know, a situation over the weekend where it looked like he was trying very hard not to say those words and really... Uh, hammer this point home that, according to the Russians, uh, that they think there was somehow uh, a Ukrainian uh, involvement. So some of the other things he said, though, uh, you know, other than doubling down on that, was that the United States was somehow, you know, hinting that it was somehow complicit, that it's now trying to convince uh, its allies, he called them satellites, and other countries around the world, that there is no Kiev trace, is the wording that uh, Putin is using, but they're continuing to look into it. And I think if you're maybe slightly confused about what he's trying to say here, that's a, a correct feeling. I think he's he's a little bit all over the place. Mm -hmm. But 
I think he's still trying to figure out exactly what he thinks happened here. Russia, of course, I think was very much blindsided by this. Uh, uh, we can see there was not much of a security response uh, in the moment at all. So I think he's trying to understand how this happened, he, and he doesn't yet know how this all fits together, but he's still trying to play with this idea. And I think it speaks to something very important about Vladimir Putin that we should all keep in mind, is this worldview of his, um, I dare say paranoid, but you know, he, he's always talking about, when he's talking about foreign actors, foreign countries, uh, doing things that Russia doesn't like, they very, he very rarely talks about them in any way that, that describes them as having you know, free will or agency, that they're always acting on someone else's behalf. Usually the CIA, if he's, if he's mm. really speaking uh, openly about it. So I, it's, it's a key insight here. And I think the big question is where he takes it. And he keeps talking about Ukraine. So I think the obvious, the obvious concern is that all of this is directed onto Ukraine in the end, Hallie. Matt Bodner, uh, thank you so much for your reporting on this. More to come, I know, in the days ahead. Appreciate it. Some big changes in the world of babysitting. How one story about teenagers ended up becoming more about parents. Christine Romans explains in tonight's Backstory. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, it's a big shift in the world of babysitting. Maybe you were one, maybe you had one, but now NBC News reporting shows some parents' attitudes toward babysitting is changing. From being pretty psyched to use like maybe a teenager, a neighbor who's looking to make a few bucks, to now seeking out sitters with serious credentials, older, more experienced. Some parents even want to see babysitters with master's degrees. Listen to what one mom is telling our Christine Romans. I really want my children to feel comfortable and for my own self to feel comfortable knowing that they're left with competent, capable, very experienced people. Christine is joining us now. We're so glad to have you on a piece. Hi. Can I be honest that originated with like a conversation that you had with our team, like yeah. in a conference room? I mean, this is really yeah. because you set out to do this story about like the pack schedules of teenagers, right. all the academic pressure, cutting down on their time to babysit. But this is really more about the parents. You know, it, it really is. And it's so fascinating to me because I thought this was about kids building a resume and they didn't have the time to, you know, take care of their, you know, snot-nosed neighbor kid. But that's not what it is at all here. Look, Care.com even says they begin uh, screening people at the age of 18. So 18 years and up. And Care.com, of course, is a, is a central place to find uh, babysitters. And we talk with a babysitter, somebody who's been babysitting since she was 13. She's 20 now. And she said she's noticed that parents are more comfortable with her as she's gotten older with more skills. Listen. I feel like adults are more likely to trust and reach out to older babysitters than they are younger ones. They feel like it's safer for their child. When I was younger, obviously, I had a lot more restrictions. Like, I couldn't drive. Now that I can drive, um, we can go and explore the towns or do whatever they might want to do. So I think both things are happening. Kids are building a resume in high school, right? And they're not really babysitting as much. At the same time, parents aren't looking for young teenagers to babysit their kids as much. What do you think that means for the teens, right? I think about I was a babysitter when I was younger. You, I know, were a, a teenage oh, yeah. babysitter as well. I mean, that's also like life experience. It's about showing up on time. It's about being responsible. It's about, you know, figuring out f even finances, right? Budgets, getting the cash from the mom or the dad on your way out the door. <laughs> I became a capitalist because of babysitting. I'm telling you right now. I started to realize, like, the, the, the twins are going to be not as uh, lucrative as the one kid who I know is going to take two naps. You know, like, you start to figure out. <laughs> which which is the best uh, babysitting uh, job to take. But I think it's really interesting. You know, we talk to a lot of different kids. Oh, a 13-year-old, for example, who's been doing this, or she's 16 now, she's been doing it since she was 13. Um, and she's really sort of growing and gaining money and understanding how to use money. But I'll tell you something interesting. In my day, you know, my parents got a teenage babysitter on the weekend. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. Today, a lot of people are two-income families. And guess what they do on the weekends? They do stuff with their kids. That's you know, such they a good spend, point. They, they spend more time with their kids, or their kids are already in daycare, so they're not getting a babysitter on the weekend. And it also varies, like, depending on where you live, I would think, right? I mean, I think there are some differences based on your community, based on your neighborhood. Like, I know in my totally. friend group, my mom group, it's actually hard to find a babysitter, teen or not, period, on a Saturday night. Yeah, that's absolutely true. It depends on where you are. And the pay is 
really varied all over the place, too. Like, out here on the East Coast, babysitters get a lot higher pay um, because a lot of times they're competing with nannies in some cases, you know, who are more than happy to do <laughs> extra hours. Um, and in the Midwest, maybe they pay a little bit less, but there's more availability. It all kind of depends on where you are. But that, you, you know, that, that rite of passage, it's not quite as entrenched as it used to be. Christine Romans, uh, it makes me think of the Babysitter's Club books that I read religiously totally. when I was a teenager, too. Thank totally. you so much. <laughs> Fascinating conversation. Glad to have you on for the backstory. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage on a busy breaking news day picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.